Hello, Internet. Gino, that pinguino, Greco, here again with another episode of Deep Listens. I am joined, as always, by Billy Bunnyface Rothert. I mean, there's been a lot of great Bunnyface characters in, uh, you know, pop culture. Name back. four. <laughs> uh, Bugs Bunny. bunny? That's not a bunny-faced character. That's a literal bunny. You have, right. you have if you want to go with this one, and Donnie, Donnie Darko. Darko. That's yeah. it. That's Donnie the only two. And this one, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That's... I'm happy to be among the ranks now. <laughs> Way to go. Way to go, champ. We are also joined by Peter the Beat Busby. All right, I'll take that one, too. It's um, one of the characters' names in this game. I don't know. Yeah, I think we've, we've probably run out of character names already. So which one's the beat? Number nine. She's number nine. Well, oh, yeah. Well, oh, she's, right. yeah, she's legit. Okay. Yeah, sweet, like, snow bunny girl. Yeah, she's legit. She sucks, but she's legit. It's also true. And we are joined by a special guest, John Billy's Reinforcements, Krish. <laughs> yep, and I have a reinforcement, another bunny mask character. Yep. Splicers from Bioshock. Yeah, uh, but ton of them wear bunny masks. Good, good get. We're going. I was be... thinking Link. If you wanted to be super generous about it, <laughs> it's a <laughs> Keaton mask. Uh... Oh, you know what? Fuck that. You don't get to count it if you're going to be that pedantic about the whole thing. Uh, maybe there's a deleted scene in Fatal Attraction. I don't know where. <laughs> Probably. Maybe I'm not sure. But today we're going to be discussing Fury, spelled F-U-R-I, uh, an action bullet hell something uh, made by the Game Bakers, which is a pretty good name. Um, we do not have feedback for this week, but if you want to get in touch with the show, at Pod on Twitter, deeplistens.libsyn.com, we have a bunch of comment sections or deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com. Billy, why don't you set us up on what Fury is? Yeah, so I picked this game. Um, I'll give the brief intro. There is um, there is a story to this game. It's kind of it's kind of loose, and the gameplay, like the, the whole game experience doesn't really revolve around the story, but the gameplay and the mechanics, but there is um, you know, a small bit of story that's progressing as you go from level to level. Um, you play as a nameless, uh, like, fighter, some kind of assassin figure. It's very unclear at the beginning of the game, but some kind of warrior, and you're locked up in prison. And you start, like, being chained up, and you are fading in and out of consciousness, and you hear a voice saying, the jailer is the key. Kill him, and you'll be free. And so that's your initial motivation. Your restraints are taken off of you, and a character, a figure in a bunny mask, some kind of bunny like rabbit hat thing with some weird microphone type deal. I'm, 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 yeah. I'm not sure. He's he a, a weird fan. character, but he's going to lead you out of prison. But in order to do that, you must get past essentially 10, 10 bosses. So get out of prison. You got to fight 10 bosses and each of them gets progressively harder and harder. There's no, like, world map or exploration, really. There's just the walking path between one fight to the next. When you're in the fight, you're doing the fight, and you're getting little bits of dialogue from the characters that you're in combat with. And between the fights, you are getting very one-sided storytelling from the bunny figure, who seems to be just sort of this, like, aloof, teleporting, Cheshire Cat kind of figure. Um, so that's, that's the story of Fury. Kill the Jailer and you'll be free. It's just a boss rush of a game and you're supposed to get to the end and, you know, fight your way through bosses for freedom. Yep, that's pretty much it. And the gameplay, when you're actually in combat, there are a couple of different modes of kind of combat in which you fight the bosses. You've got kind of a dual stick shooter sort of control where you're controlling with the left analog stick, you should play this game with a controller. It yes. Is ma- it is made to be played with a controller. Um, left analog stick moves you. Right <laughs> analog stick, when you're in this kind of run around mode, um, shoots just a, a pistol of some kind. 
You can also perform a charged shot, which will kind of knock it. It will deal more damage and knock enemies over. It will also pierce through uh, a lot of different projectiles. Uh, you have a melee attack, and then you have a parry that kind of blocks certain moves, and then a dodge that you can also charge to dodge further distances. You have a charge melee attack, too. Yeah, you also have a charge melee attack. Now, mm -hmm. most of the boss fights will start in kind of a Pokemon Stadium. Is it Pokemon Stadium? What is it? That new Pokemon fighting game. Pokemon Tournament? Kind of a Pokemon Tournament-esque okay. battle system where you start far out doing kind of distance and ranged combat moves, and then you kind of get in close. Like something kind of triggers like a state change. It and it goes... health bar going down or something. Right. You'll... Every... Most... Every boss has multiple health bars, and some health bars, when you deplete them, the boss will enter a weakened state, at which point you hit them, and then you start a, a round of close combat to kind of finish out their health bar. Sometimes you just take a health bar down, and that health bar's gone, and you move on to the next phase of the fight. But each boss has a combination of those two different types of combat. And once you get in close, you have... Basically all the same options except your pistol and ranged attacks have been replaced with a charge that just kind of adds power to your attacks. And everything For the else semantics to make it easier, um, we should call it by their real names, which is that one's called boost. Just so we don't say charge for two things and mean two different like mean the same thing for two different things. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That that one's called boost and then the actual charge melee attack is called charge. Which wait, is, wait. Which one's called boost? The one where you your sword t turns orange. Yeah, like orange. your sword turns orange. Okay, that one's boost. The one where you're like Goku, the one yeah. where you charge up, power up. It's yeah. called boost. Gotcha. Okay. It's not charge. It's not be boost. crazy. Yeah, but, but just for clarity, that is most of that is all of the game basically. Um, and. Yeah. Each of the uh, each of the different bosses, they go through several phases. I would say that it's really a game with ten levels, even though it's ten bosses, because each right. each boss has so many different phases that it kind right. of encompasses a level unto itself. Like some <laughs> bosses will begin with kind of a platforming section where you're dodging, and then you get in close and it's combat. Or after taking down two health bars, they'll like rip a piece of you know. Armor, armor off, off and that faster sudden, or something. Yeah. yeah, they get new moves. And you every kind of boss to... fight's like escalating as you like shed layers of their health. They get like harder and harder or more extreme or faster or something. Until their final health bar, which is almost always some form in which they are completely invincible, just sending waves of bullet hell nonsense at you, and you just have to dodge it until uh, until they stop, and then you hit them once and they die. Which I detested. But we'll get to that later. Um, we'll get to any... all the things Gina detests. Um, what did you guys think of the different bosses and the and the combat system in general? I guess. Don't all jump in at once. I mean, I'm trying not not to jump in every time. Billy, what, I... start us off, Billy. Open okay. the waters. Um, <clears throat> I liked the so in general, this was one of the most enjoyable combat games for me. Um, I really enjoy combat of games like Shadow of the Colossus, where your moves feel meaningful. Like every every move and every parry and every strike feels like it has meaning behind it. Then again, I also like games like Valda's Story, that had similar like screens but, filled with hot bullshit and like a lot of stuff was going on at once. Billy, are you referring to Game of the Year Valda's Story? Yeah, Game of the Year oh, Valda's okay. Story. Okay, just making sure. Um. And so this, I think, is a, a myriad of both. I enjoyed the fast pace, like super quick reflex outer modes of the game where you are in this open world or sorry, not open, world, but like a very open arena. And there's a lot of stuff coming at you and you're you have to dodge quickly, respond quickly, have lots of very like fine tuned actions. And then inside the close range, um, it's a very like parry, repost, like counter hit big impact kind of moves that I liked and um, I, I felt combat like that in games like Shadow of the Colossus where you have to respond to a huge threat and strike very critically to um, to achieve your goals in that sort of combat sequence. I liked the pairing of those two wildly different game styles. 
Yeah, because when you were talking about, you know, screens full of fast-paced stuff, I was thinking of Game of 2015 Undertale. <laughs> like a bullet hell sort of thing. That's what it made me think of. You're That's right. Weird. If only you know, there was two, airplane. two great games just happen to, you know, have similarities with this with this third weird. great game. Yeah, so... I, Someone else go because I'm yeah. going to say a lot of things about this stuff. So, okay. Uh, I guess I yeah. can go. Yeah, let's get the good I'm things on, out of the way. Yeah. Uh, I I really enjoyed the game. I liked. Uh, I liked how different all the bosses were. They each had their own very unique like feel. They usually had some unique mechanic. It. It a game about only boss fights they made a lot of it and it all felt different it was exciting to find a new boss work through it beat it and move on to the next thing uh the story you know it's there it's not great like it's cliche it's overplayed but it's there And it contributes to making these distinct environments that you go from place to place, the arenas, you fight the bosses. Yeah, Yeah, I I found that the environments and the character designs were much... I liked them a whole lot. Uh, This game was, at least the character designs, were done by Takashi Okazaki, who designed Afro Samurai, which as soon as I booted this game up, I'm like, oh, these guys have watched Afro Samurai once or twice. Or three yeah. times, or a lot, and then it was just—it was actually just the character designer from Afro Samurai, and it, everything made a whole lot more sense at that point. Which got heads. Just to jump in for a moment, I like after playing the game, I was like, "All right, I'll rewatch Afro Samurai a little bit." Not that good of a show. No, yeah. that's fine though. Eh, Pretty poor. I liked it. I, th- I feel like it was good. I feel like Samuel L. Jackson went in. Oh, he was going ham. Like he was yeah, the, dialed in. He was ready. The great, yeah. great character, Ninja Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, for a second there was like, was this like an Afro Samurai game that lost the license? Yeah, it's like shit. We got to port this pretty quick. <laughs> but no, no, they, it was an original that they had the same de- designer, and I found that I really enjoyed the designs specifically, like how the characters looked. Their different themes, and especially the worlds that each of them kind of called their home. The walk-ups all... to them were beautiful. They were beautiful. The the part where you have to play walking up, if you decide <laughs> to play it, is terrible. Ugh. It might have some of the worst 3D controls I've seen in a very long time. Like, this, most of the time when you are in a 3D perspective from a stationary camera... Your mo- their, your movement is relative to either your character's direction or to the camera. So if a camera is in the top right corner and your character is moving, you know, facing right, that means that either up is up relative to where the camera is looking or up means your character moves forward because your character is facing forward. Like, I expect one of those two, either tank controls or... Everything's relative to the camera. This game does not do either of those. So I can explain it to you so it makes sense. It is... You're not supposed to explore these walk-ups there. It's just a corridor. So when you start in those sections, if you hold up, that's usually the first direction to go. Every time the screen transitions, you will keep going the direction you were going. So you can just hold up and go through those. You can also just hit a button to auto-walk. But the mixing between movement types, that's not actually happening. As soon as you let go of your control stick, it resets to what the camera is facing. So anytime you're confused, if you literally just let go of the control stick, it moves like you would expect. But you're not supposed to explore, so it's not... Yeah, and there's my another problem. game. Another game does this... Uh, sort of like when I I'm, I'm actually just casually playing Metroid Prime now and when you earn like morph ball mode it happens like John is saying it happens too like there's times where you're like magneting up like a ceiling and you're like going upside down and the camera's trying to follow you and if you just keep holding forward it will do exactly like what John's saying forward just means you make forward progress 
and if you let go, then it will do like a reset and just start like the the way you're actually oriented matters, and you hold a different direction. And if you just keep holding it, then you're then you're moving forward. Um, I I think that this part of the game should be um, defended. There's three. Yeah, so obviously I'm going to defend it, but um, I think this is like let me criticize it first. I, I I'm not so much worried about its um, about its mechanic, like its movement. I'm more worried that there wasn't more to do. If they're going to give me movement like this, where I'm in control between levels, I want there to be some kind of collectible. I want there to be some kind of interactable or collectible or something. It doesn't have to be a collectible where like I get them all and something cool happens. But if I, I mean. They actually kind of did it a little bit in Jotun, right? There were some pieces of the environment that you could just interact with. You know, you just, like smack a barrel and it like jiggles, or like a, one of the gnomes like jump out or something. Or you go to like the roots of Yggdrasil and you like smack a branch and something cool happens. But this doesn't have any of that. It, it's got three times in the game where the walking matters, and um, other than that, it's it's irrelevant but they they really couldn't they really couldn't have those three important times where it does matter like be hidden and easter eggy defined if they if you only had controls in those parts of the game so they kind of had to put them ev- everywhere else in order to make it not completely obvious that there was something going on does that make sense no no but well uh, do you so do you think the game would be served better if these walking sections didn't exist if they were just cutscenes. No, I would I would prefer if these walking sections just controlled like. So, so how would you do it better? Screens. How would you do I'd a camera transition and keep walking where you want to walk? I think that you could try and either have an, a single camera, a la God of War, where it's a scripted camera that's following you, but taking but moving to places where they are still framed shots. The problem that they had that I think that they were trying to solve was that their bunny dude teleports around, and so they have to move from different static shots so that you don't see the character model blink either... Either they have the character model rendered in multiple places simultaneously, or he's deleting from one location and being play- another copy of him is being placed someplace else. So having the camera move dynamically, you would see the seams where you know he vanishes and then reappears. I think that's what they were trying to deal with by having the camera move from different static positions. But if they just figured out how to get the camera to be dynamic, and this is hard. I'm not saying that this is like a super easy fix. But if they manage to make it move, then you can have the controls be more standardized or have a transition where you neutralize the controls and let me refigure them out. Like something be, something that forces me to do what you said and put the control back to neutral, um, that way I can then get reoriented to the controls. Because there were times when I would be holding the stick and all of a sudden the camera would move and I'd keep holding the stick because I'm still moving. And I think that now the right, you know, the right way to move is, you know, down into the left to make my character go up into the right, because that's what it was before I, the camera transitioned. And I encountered this problem just because I wanted to explore those locations. They are a lot of them are really well rendered. They are well realized. Like the third boss, um, the he's line an old man with uh, headphones, headphones and a bandaid on his forehead. Yeah, the line. He his area is basically almost a Zen garden, like big rolling sands, beautiful colors, uh, different floating pieces like islands floating in space, uh, with little uh, bridges extending out from one to the other, and it's gorgeous. And I wanted to walk around and try to see if there was anything in these nooks and crannies because I think that the environment designers did a great job. And any time the camera transitioned, all of a sudden I'd be walking into a wall and just didn't know how to stop it from walking into the wall. Because sometimes when you get the controls back to neutral, then it's super disorienting because before, like, down was up. And now up is up. And you don't necessarily... The game doesn't tell you why it all of a sudden figured it out. You Sometimes I accidentally put it back in neutral and the controls all of a sudden made sense. And I didn't experiment enough to figure out that it was that was what was doing it. I just eventually learned that you press the X button to auto walk 
and then I just did that every single time because the game, it turns out, will just walk you down kind of the ideal corridor. And some of the camera angles for when you want to kind of explore off to the side aren't actually that great. So you, it's hard to see what I expected to be there, even if I take control and, and kind of move in those directions. I, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to this when we get to Spoiler Town. I feel like Spoiler Town can can help me defend this a little a little bit better. So we'll circle back here. Um, All right. Well, I, before we leave, I want to take... So I would have rather they were just cutscenes. Because in my mind, see, the game doesn't encourage exploration, and it sort of does a poor job of allowing it. So then my question becomes, what's the utility in allowing the player to control the character in these scenes? Is there an argument to be made? Are you try, is anybody here trying to make the argument that there's just some sort of, uh, what's the word I want? Implicit, isn't it? Some sort of intrinsic value in allowing player control. Because I, I think that's the only way you could justify it. I'm actually going to agree with you a little bit here, Pete, and say I'm that. I'm not saying that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree I, with your like criticism. Okay. That this game's exploration is super limited. And there's a lot of games that have done exploration way better than, than this game. Um, I am, as a person who loves exploration, wished there was more. I was only mildly satisfied when I found the few times that it does matter. But you're right. There's a ton of exploration opportunity that's just missed here. There, there's exploration stuff that is missed. And I feel like they could have done more, even if it was just little stuff. Um, you asked a question, is the fact that a player gets to explore intrinsically good? And the answer is no. Um, this is, you know, I'm thinking of a game or, cu- or a couple games where exploration is kind of is kind of shitty and the option to explore is terrible. Stuff like um, like Skyrim or Fallout where the world's so huge, your option to explore everything can hinder your progress, I think. I did to you just my knowledge, the very idea of sandbox games. Yeah, to my knowledge, that is the only thing worthwhile about either of those games. All right. Well, as a person who is who is very grindy and very and very completionist, I will just get lost in that stuff and not play the game anymore. So There's I find that kind of like. I feel like we're getting a, to a deeper philosophical conversation right. about Billy. But then here's but then here's a game that did it well. The Ratchet and Clank series had exploration that really really paid off because it gave you two cool things. One was very simple and easy transportation mechanics there were like there were collectibles in that game yeah bolts but it gave you a map that showed you when you were done the map told you when you had covered every single like inch of the map and so it made exploration like very easy to know when you're here's the important part there's a bar to fill to a hundred percent and then when you get to 100 percent, it tells you so that you're done with the game forever you got all the things Nail the disc to your wall, just like another one finished. Oh, so, Jesus. Let me, I think that there is some intrinsic value in the exploration in this game because there were some times when I took direct control and maneuvered to a place that was not on the critical path and the camera actually moved to an angle that showed me a really well-composed shot and a really beautiful environment that if you just press the X button and let it go, you wouldn't have seen. And that lets you see just a little bit more of the environments that I think, like I said, I think they're very well done uh, for the most part. Um, All right. Well, this is, I mean, I'm splitting hairs here, but that wouldn't be an intrinsic good. My question is sort of more abstract than that, just because we brought it up here. It's that whether allowing the player, allowing me as the player to have control as often and as much as possible is inherently better game design than not allowing that, than taking control from me. When Pete and I did philosophy stuff, and actually John was in this class with us, John was in a class with me, so there's a question whether or not giving a person a choice is intrinsically good. There are some times where you have a choice to make, and you would be better off not having an option to option to choose. One example in the philosophical realm is like being invited to a dinner party that you don't want to go to. You have two options. You can say you're going to go or you can say you're not going to go. And if you say you're going to go, you have to go through this dinner party that you don't want to go to. And if you say you're not going to go, you probably hurt somebody's feelings. So you'd be better off not having the choice in that in in that sense. In this sense, I think um, in, from a from a game design perspective, I 
think that it is not always good to have exploration be an option. If you're going to make exploration an option, you have to be make it. You have to make it there for something. So, Pete, to answer your question, which I believe was just, is having control an intrinsic good? Just flat, right? Is that yeah, better is game design, period? Better game design, more elegant, however you want to phrase it, sure. I don't think that it is for all types of games, but I think in a game like this where control and responsiveness and kind of presence in a space is so central to the game itself, I think that in this game specifically, it could have been a benefit. Because one of the things that this game... If I'm going to ascribe themes to Fury, which it doesn't... Like, the narrative doesn't give me a lot of stuff to play around with, but one of the only themes that it really delves into is the inherent worth of this world you're in and the people you're interacting with. Even though the only way you get to interact with them is fucking killing them. Um, The game asks, like, is this world worth is this world worth exploring and worth saving and worth experiencing? And I think in my own moments where I was exploring the intermediary spaces between these fights, I found a beauty there that actually moved me to care about this game in a way that the writing sure as fuck didn't, the combat system sure as fuck didn't, and it was actually kind of in the Zen Garden experiencing this place and saying, hey, I want to know the dude who thought that this was the place he wants to live in. I find that a lot more interesting than any other way I'm interacting with these people. But the idea that a person would have wanted this to be the world that they live in forever, that was way more interesting to me. And unfortunately, when you are controlling the game and kind of walking around these spaces, the narration plays out at a constant clip, assuming that you press the X button. So the bunny man just keeps talking at a steady pace, and then he'll run out of dialogue. And that's how you know that you've spent too much time or not too much, more time than they expected actually looking at the environment, which just kind of annoyed me um, that they, they just play it and assume that you're walking along the critical path. So here's, here's what I think is kind of important here. If this was a cutscene and you didn't have to walk through it, I think a lot of people going to a game about boss fights would just be like, I don't care about the story. I'm going to skip this cutscene. Next fight. Let's go. But making you walk through it as a player, you are controlling it. You have to be present for that. And you cannot like the story, but the story gives it enriches the boss fights and the characters. It feels like you're fighting like a character that's like cool you're learning about them during the things and having you walk through it makes you pay attention to what's going on i agree but then it's weird that they let you skip the cutscenes what cutscenes you get to skip the pre-fight and post-fight cutscenes well you want to you can skip it's a weird hodgepodge with and i agree john i think that that's a good call like in a game where the narrative is so sparse making you experience the, like it's two minutes or three minutes between a fight it's nothing to just kind of give a greater context i think that that makes sense but i think then you go all the way with it and make the cutscenes unskippable too because they also are one to two minutes i think there's also an argument to be made here just you know based on sort of like you said the type of game about some sort of value of the kinesthetic connection between player and character could you define kinesthetic for i'm about to do it okay good great so wavelength yeah, we're on the same page. So in this case, like the combat and sort of that fast twitch is so important to the way the game plays. Like you need to be sort of one with, you know, body and soul with your your character, your avatar here. So by forcing you to maintain that connection, it enhances that kinesthetic connection. The idea that sort of your movements of the joystick create those movements of the character that's sort of central to this combat. Here. Yeah, and makes one sense. other thing about the cutscenes that I like that makes sense to me. But one other thing about the cutscenes is that when you are in combat and there are transitions between, so once you get a health bar down, sometimes there will be a transition between kind of health bars, like maybe someone, like we said, breaks off a restraint or charges up in some way or you know changes the arena in a fundamental way. There's then an unskippable cutscene. You can't skip any of the cutscenes during battle. 
It's only pre and post, and then you can fast forward through the walking by just pressing X to auto walk. So there's this weird thing where when you're in the combat, when you will most need to be kind of focused, and this is a game about dying and repeating and dying and repeating, that is the only cutscene you can't skip. And once you die in a boss battle, if you stop the game, you come back and you are immediately in the boss battle. It skips all the cutscenes and just puts you in it. So it's weird to me that the cutscenes that you would see the most because you're playing, you know, you're fighting these bosses 90% of the time you're playing this game. Those are the cutscenes you can't skip at all. And they're the ones where the boss, like, taunts you and then does a charging. Dear animation. Lord, that dialogue, too. The so, boss dialogue. Oh, my God. So you're talking about the cutscenes when you, like, when you take down one of their pips of health or when you lose a pip? Yeah. Yes. So, like, so those need to be unskippable because they're a break. Like, for, like, three minutes you're fighting this phase, you finally get through it. You want to immediately go into the next phase. You don't want like a ten second like mental break. I want an I want the option sometimes because some of these bosses I fought upwards of twenty times. Just and how trying how to learn long would you say the longest cutscene was? Oh, probably like it, 10, 20 seconds. It, but it can't I don't be more think than it's 10. ever twenty seconds. Yeah, it can't be more than ten. Even ten when I'm like in the flow. Watching this dude for the twentieth or you know twentieth time go, you're not gonna beat me, and then like do a pose. <laughs> it, it's, it's ten that, seconds of your life you'll never get back. It's not that so much as just like <laughs> when, we, when we talked about Mirror's Edge and how sometimes there are parts where you're jumping and you fall to your death, and now you just have to watch that ten seconds of setup again. It when it just keeps happening over and over and over again, it just makes it more frustrating. And it's a game that's already difficult and already frustrating. At least for me. I just found it odd that I couldn't just press X and then just be in it. True. I mean, I think this game was sort of like be betraying part of its, um, like part of its style if it let you just uh, like skip part of its tempo. I think this game is very much a tempo game where you have to be in the rhythm and in things. And I, I mean, that, that has been said already. But if you don't have, like, forced pauses and forced breaks where, I mean, what I was doing in those breaks was, like, getting into the aesthetics, getting into the music, getting into everything and, like, seeing the next setup. And I was like, all right, ready to go. Like, reset. It's a new life. And a lot of times it was that time for me to, like, clear up my head and, and cool down. I would watch my health meter go back up or their health meter go back up and say, all right, reset. Let's do this. I mean, I think there was absolutely necessary because if you play games that have instant resets um games like i want to be the guy for example or doesn't braid also have one too i mean you just rewind it's not well either way like if you have instant resets you can get into like a like a like 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 a raid cycle and then you just keep failing and failing and failing and you just fail faster as opposed to taking those forced pauses to reset and think which that happened to me anyway so i don't I, that didn't save me at all. I've played. I've I've played. I want to be the guy, and I and I stopped beating that game. That's a game that took the grinding and bullshit too far for even me. And I said oh, the wow. fact that I can just instant reset didn't help because it just made me fail harder and think less. And the pauses here made me, when I failed, consider my failures and think about what I should be doing differently. It it, it, sort, it sort of forced me, and I them them forcing me to do that was them taking an option away from me, and it made my gameplay experience better. All right, fair enough. I, I it's not a big deal one way or the other. It didn't that wasn't what upset me. Um, so since we're in the gameplay section, actually, I'm gonna have a larger philosophical discussion about these types of games. Should we do that before we discuss spoilers or after? I think that it might that discussion might fit in here because we're talking purely about gameplay. All right, toss it out then. Um, I have a I would describe this game as a get good or a get good game. Uh, it is a style of game that has risen to prominence largely after Dark Souls and Demon Souls. I would say uh, this recent return to like difficult games for difficulty's sake. They are largely action games where the deaths deaths are frequent and uh, resets are pretty fast you're generally just bashing your head against an enemy over and over and over again until you memorize its pattern 
Um, they usually have some sort of fast twitch element where you're timing uh, your attacks to a boss. Um, sometimes there's grinding involved, sometimes not, but largely it's about you're not your character's not getting better, you're getting better is is how these games tend to play out. Like I'm the person who's leveling up, not my character. With <clears throat> with Demon Daggers is probably the purest distillation of this as a genre. Yeah, Devil De- Daggers Devil is, Devil is Daggers. like that. And Would you consider like old arcade games kind of like that too, where like you getting better at it is also a financial incentive? You have to pay less quarters because you're better at the game. Are you going to draw that analogy too? I would say you could, but those games. So the difference between something like Fury and arcade games was arcade games were designed to suck quarters out of you. They were designed to be inherently unfair. And no one, there was never an implication that you were too weak or bad to beat these games on one credit. I feel like get good games, there is a culture, I don't know if it's the culture around it or if the games foster this culture, but if you're not playing it well, it's not the game's fault. It's never the game's fault. It's your fault for being too slow, dumb. The implication is the weakness is always with the player and not with the game because the game's controls are too tight, too precise, too strong. The design is too too good for it to be its fault. And so if it's difficult, it's your fault for not figuring out how to play it better. And at least as someone who's been on an internet forum, that is like a lot of the sentiment I see around these types of games. And with a kind of moral element to it, like, if you don't get it, you're what's wrong with games in some way. That's this kind of design. That design, I don't think that that is inherent to, like, Fury specifically, that this was the developer, anything to do with the developer necessarily. But the idea that I need to bang my head against this game's mechanics to learn a very specific set of inputs that I need to do to get through it Otherwise, I'm weak or bad at games. I just hate games that Im- make me feel like that is the implication. Um, and a game like this where the bosses are difficult and constantly kind of mocking you with their dialogue, saying, come on, is that all you can do? Is that the best you've got? Um, coupled with... I guess the the larger discussion going on around a game like this where it's almost always described as hard but fair instead of just difficult. It's always hard but fair, so if if you're screwing up it's your fault and not that this game has some patterns that are really difficult and kind of bullshit. Um that that style of design really bugs me because I feel like it puts a a kind of moral judgment or a evaluative judgment on the player saying that they are lesser for either not enjoying this type of game or not being very good at this type of game. So it, do you see where I'm coming from on, on some of that stuff? Yeah, I do. Um, I would agree on some parts of the points that you made. Like, I think a game telling you to just memorize more, just just practice more, just get good, is a bad motivation to play a game. I mentioned a game like I Want to Be the Guy. And while that game is fun and popular and was well made for what it was trying to do, like that game was trying to be like an insanity gauntlet. Um, That game, if you walk into a level, you sometimes you have a zero percent chance of finishing the level because the ground could just explode underneath you. You didn't know that you had to do some weird complex series of stuff that is impossible to know on your first playthrough. Like, I think a game like that is just bullshit for bullshit's sake. And um, I'm not going to put Fury in that, in, that, in that category. Now, I'm not just going to cop out and say it's hard but fair because I don't want to just say what you're trying to defeat. And so, like, you say it's hard but fair is bad, and I say, no, hard but fair is good. Like, I don't want to just go right back at you and push um, on this, like, block that we're just, like, pushing and no one's getting anywhere. Um, I'm going to say that this game... It's just asking you new questions over and over again. Like every time the question is asked, sorry, I'm not phrasing this very well, but like every boss is asking you a very different question. Can you do this now? Can you do this now? And it's leading you to this like level up 
mechanic of yourself. And you're right. There is some sort of like meta game level up. The player is leveling up. I'm getting better at this stuff because I'm starting to think differently about how I enter these combat sequences. Every boss asks you new questions. So yeah, it's hard and yeah, it's fair, but it's there for a reason. It's there to, it's there to progress. Not only your, yourself as a player, not only to progress the start, but to, but to progress your experience. I'm the kind of player who gets more out of a game for being good at it. And this doesn't mean that I'm going to say, I'm going to do a naked dark souls run. And just like, I'm going to put it on my, on my, on my like blog that I did it. And then people will thumb it up. And now I can, you know, feel good about myself. It's sort of, I practice something really hard and now I'm able to achieve it. I get the same kind of gratification from fighting games. You know, why do people spend hours and hours into the training room practicing combos, if not to go online and execute them when the pressure's on? I think this game is drawing from that kind of gratification that, wow, like there's a really hard thing to do and I've practiced and now I can do it reliably. Now I'm going to execute it. I'm going to get gratification from the execution. This game's hard. It's, it's hard in a lot of ways. It's very challenging and can be frustrating. A game like I Want to Be the Guy is the bad version of that. And I think this is actually a positive version because I'm actually being enhanced. My gameplay is being enhanced by its by its difficulty and its sort of punishing nature. I think that the difference between this game and I Want to Be the Guy is that you like this game and you don't like playing I don't I Want to Be the Guy. The difference between the two is this game doesn't just throw hot bullshit at you without throwing bullshit at you first. Of <laughs> The, <laughs> yeah. the next step, it, it's always a relatively small step. You never have to make a huge leap in practice and learning yeah. what the game wants you to do. Yeah, I think you're right. Where I want to be the guy, it's <clears throat> you literally cannot prepare for what it is throwing at you. I think the biggest leap in Fury is from the burst to the edge, from Sniper Lady to Samurai Oh, I disagree. I thought that the big, the biggest jump for me was the bursts, like fifth health bar to sixth health bar. The one because oh. every boss, without fail, their last health bar is a bar where either they become a boss in a twin stick bullet hell shooter where they are completely invulnerable and just fill the screen with different bullet patterns that you have to dodge, or maybe they're vulnerable for like a half second, or they go into a mode where they are just throwing... They're, like, borderline invincible, and you have to parry them. And it becomes high-level Simon Says. Where but then just... again, like, the game would... Like, that's the two modes the game has to offer. So it's going to give you, like, final boss mode of one of those two options. Like, does the game have a third option? No, I'm saying that it's... Up until then, it's dodge, counterattack, dodge, counterattack, dodge, counterattack. There are ways to regain health because you're parrying, or you can escape because you can run away a little bit and gain some space. There's room to improvise, at least a little bit, and it's not much, but it's better than nothing. And then the final stages of all of these bosses are, you are locked into this arena, deal with this pattern. The patterns are going to be the same pattern every fucking time. Until you realize what this pattern is, you're just going to die because you can't defend yourself in any other way. You just have to deal with the pattern. And after three or four or five health bars to get to that point, hitting me with waves of nonsense then adds like five. So you get three. We didn't mention this, but you get three retries at most. Um, you lose a retry every time you lo you die, essentially. And every time you beat a health bar of your opponent, you regain a retry. So that means when you get to the final stage, um, you have at most three chances to get it right. If you fail that, you do not start at that level again, at that health bar again. You start again at the very front of the fight. Which means if your problem with a boss is the last segment, you then have to fight all five or six of their previous forms to get to that point that you're having a problem with. And that f segment can then have multiple phases to it unto itself. And so for me, boss seven, I b almost wanted to quit because that boss takes place in a very big arena. You have to track her down multiple times to even get to the point where you're dealing with her first three forms. Then you have to deal with two fights in close quarters where she then like vanishes again and like calls in random bullshit enemies and then you have close combat to deal with and then her final form is 
one of the most difficult bullet hell sequences in the entire game, and then is followed up by a close combat sequence that is probably one of the most... Eh, not that. It's not yeah, as difficult as it's anything still, in Boss 8. It's still really hard. It's, it's the hardest really one hard. up until that point. Yes. All of which are in her final form, and she is invulnerable until you get into that first close combat section, which means you just have to deal with her patterns for like a minute. And if you don't know how to do it, you just have to keep fighting her first five five forms until you get the last one right. That that whole process took me three or four hours. I played this game for eight. So, And that's not fun at all. I didn't enjoy any of that. I'm going to say that I agree on one of your points where if this game gives me power to act and power to do stuff and there's like always a right answer to whatever the thing is um, and there is. Throwing at it's, you. There it's, is. Sim- it's bop it. It's high level right. bop it. Hey, just hang tight, all right? So I agree that if every other part of the game except the last phase of every boss fight, I have autonomy and I, I have a way to like control my own destiny. In this part, I'm sort of like helpless and I have to just survive until I can act again. I agree that's not the most fun part of this game. Um, I think that pairing off what John said, every time you have one of those sequences, like the very first one, the chain, has one of those sequences where he's just invincible for a while and he's throwing hot bullshit over the screen, but it's not that bad. It's like your run-of-the-mill bullet hell shooter and you're just, you're shooting back and you're able to survive. It's not very difficult. Boss 2 and 3 have it. Boss sorry, boss four. bosses 2, 4, and 6 have it. And up until then, like those are the, those are pretty hard, and they get escalatingly harder. So you should be ready for boss seven, sniper lady, the burst. That's what the game's saying. It's saying it's saying you should be ready for this, and it gives you the option to go like practice the other bosses and see what their kind of like gameplay is. What should I have learned from this other boss fight? But each of these bosses have different mechanics unto themselves. So even if I'm learning how to how to dodge better, or how to attack better, or how to block better. It's not like the parry timing for one person applies across all of them. They all have different animations. Like, the way that I learned how to beat Boss 7 was memorizing every single one of her moves, memorizing exactly what to do, and it's one answer. There's one, maybe two answers to any given move, and it's parry or dodge. That's it. Sometimes it's hit them because they're taunting you, and they're giving you a free hit. But those are the answers. Like, okay, this this animation means they're going to attack one time, and then I need to attack. Because if you miss your window to counterattack, it's not like they just stand there and let you hit them. They just then go into another animation. And so at a certain point, I was like, okay, this is her one-hit combo. This is her two-hit combo. This is her three-hit combo. Oh, she's taking her gun out, which means I dodge left, dodge right, dodge straight. And I just kept memorizing it, and I was like, okay, now I know all of her animations. Not how to play this game much better across all of the characters because the dodge timings and the block timings are different for every character. There are some characters like Boss 8 who his whole gimmick is he has animations that look like the parry timings should be different. But they're feigns. And so his parry timings are fucked up compared to what some of the other characters are. There's uh, characters where... They have beam moves that just kind of sweep across the screen, and you have to just kind of dodge left, dodge right, whatever it is. Some of them have AoEs where the move is to dodge forward. But until you learn exactly what those moves' properties are, you can't react. You can try and react to them, but you're going to be wrong enough times that you're probably going to die. Yeah, I I don't feel like I had to memorize ever. Yeah, yeah I think you're holding this game to like way higher of a standard then is appropriate saying that oh the timings are different so the lessons are meaningless all right specifically sniper lady her final phase that gave you so much trouble from what i remember she sends out waves from her and waves come in from the side and mm-hmm. you have to dodge weave in and out okay boss four teaches you that like, you are taught that on not, oh, the exact spacing and timing, you are taught how to weave back and forth, back and forth. Like, it's not something new that it's 
it's just like you can never learn this previously in the game. Just because the numbers are different doesn't mean it's entirely unique. It's not entirely unique, but also I've played these style of games before. So like the idea of dodging, weaving back and forth. One, I think if you haven't played this style of game before, this game's going to brutalize you. It is three different very difficult types of action game all at once. It is an action game, it is a twin stick shooter, and it has these bullet hell segments where it is purely survival. Um, if you don't, if you're not already a borderline expert in how to play this style of game, this game doesn't teach you that much. Yeah, it does. Like, okay, it so expects you to know some of this stuff. So this brings me into something that I think is important to note: gaming has grown greatly. Over the years, the audience is much bigger. You can not you can appeal to everyone, but sometimes you might want to appeal to specific crowds. A lot of games that are more story-focused wouldn't appeal to necessarily these people. For me, I kind of see this game as, like, if you take old games that emphasize boss fights, like maybe like Mega Man or Castlevania, you take those boss mechanics, they've been growing over, like, two two decades now. This game is a, a great uh, entry into that legacy. Yeah, I mean... I, I, I lost my train of thought. I mean, <laughs> I, and I see that lineage, I just... <sighs> All right, yeah, Heroes is where I was going. It just because like this isn't for you doesn't mean it's bad it's for a specific audience they it's maybe not accessible to you but that is the directorial choice of the people who made it they wanted people to have a certain experience playing this game and if you don't like it that's okay there are there are plenty plenty of games game well, there's never been a better time to play games i agree let me put it to you this way my problem was not necessarily with this game unto itself i actually didn't find this game all that difficult until boss seven um my bigger issue like i said with get good games is kind of the inherent social pressure that if you're not enjoying it the problem is not with this style of game it is with you and the moment when I started getting pissed at this game was when I was actually talking to you, Billy, and you said, I think Boss 8 might make you quit. If you haven't gotten to, if Boss Seven's giving you trouble, I think Boss 8 might make you quit. Which basically, as soon as I heard that, I'm like, you're not tough enough or good enough to beat Boss 8. I think you're soft. And as soon as I had that in my head... I was like, fuck this game, I'm going to beat it. And that's the whole reason I ever played Dark Souls 2, was because I just didn't want to have some stupid black mark on my gaming history, where people who are into these games say that, well, if I can't appreciate them, I, I don't... You're the problem. Yeah. I'm not author authoritative. Like, I write about games semi-professionally. Like, I, I want to have that experience and be capable of talking about these things. And... It's just a posturing, kind of a chest poundy posturing that I don't appreciate at all. And I feel like these games lean into it really hard in some ways that I don't think is necessarily the developer's fault. I just think it encourages that kind of comparison. And in a fighting game, there is inherently a social construct because you need other people to play against and you can kind of communicate with these kind of games, the only way that you can kind of express dominance is by creating a kind of a, a sense of rivalry. Whereas there was with Devil Daggers, we talked about how it kind of instills a community because the only way it's fun is if you have someone else to compete against. With these games, it feels more like, I did it, so look at me, I'm so tough. And I, I don't get a lot of enjoyment out of just purely getting past these bosses because... This game's paper thin. Like I enjoyed some of some of the bosses, but 
I don't feel like they're adversarial. Like, that that never pushed me forward. And the gameplay was not so fun unto itself that I would have ever progressed. But because of this podcast and because, you know, I, I have to play it, um, it just made it a little bit more anxious for me to be playing through it. So I'm going to take your comparison to fighting games. Uh, I'm going to say some people react to challenges positively or negatively you react negatively to this game but you like the challenges of fighting games for me i like this type of challenge there's a specific set of rules that i can learn and deal with them and figure it out in fighting games i have a lot of fun in them but anytime i'm really challenged to get better get good it it just frustrates me because it feels like the line is constantly moving. There is no, and there's no. You are up. good. So, just because this game frustrates you, doesn't it? I don't think it says anything bad about this game. It just you now know about yourself that you don't like this type of experience. I think another you knew thing, that before you came into it, but I, I think another thing is I, I I would look at a game like Dark Souls or this game or any other game that's hard for um like that's like intended to be challenging and demand a lot of the players. I I don't see games like that as being like a chess beating contest. Like I beat it, but you didn't, so I'm better than you. I think then, of it as like a well. I don't see it like that. I see it like, wow, this is a really ordeal of a game. And once you beat it, it doesn't matter how you beat it. Um, you get to like, so like sharing your experiences with other players who beat it. And like, maybe, maybe you make yourself in a different crowd of those who haven't played the game, but you do that by being a gamer in a world with non gamers anyway. So I think being, beating a game like dark souls and I beat it in a way that people would say had no skill at all. Some people say that the final boss of Dark Souls is supposed to be like, you're like, oh, all you gotta do is like counter hit him, like parry him, and it's so easy. I just loaded myself with like as much armor and health as possible and just tanked him and like used a bunch of heals until he ran out of health first. That was like the most cop out way of beating that game, but it doesn't matter. I beat Dark Souls. Likewise, in this game, there's a lot of ways you can approach a boss fight. Sometimes there is just like one way that you have to progress through a particular phase, but I think the game never ask anything that's unfair of you so and because the game gives you every single move and ability and teaches you everything you need at every stage of the game it's not gonna say like you're inferior because you can't do this it's gonna say try something different like maybe you have a new strategy i mean i've played this game through about four times now and i think every time i've approached a boss i've done something really different each time like parrying when I didn't parry before and I, I unlock new combat sequences or new ways to get an advantage. Or I'll say, what happens if I just dodge a bunch here and like make them like run, run out of steam? Maybe they open up then. Like I've just learned so much more about the sequences by playing and replaying. I feel like this game is, is, is meant to be positively challenging and not like, you suck, you can't beat this game. Then why do all the bosses say nothing but you suck, do better whenever it, you die? It's just how you react to it. It's just script. Know. Like it, it doesn't anger me when the video game character says, you're a noob. All right. I have some things to say. Allow me to say some things. All right, yes, go ahead, Pete. Do. So I don't think this is a question that can be sidestepped through sort of appeal to audience by suggesting that sort of these games appeal to a select niche. It has to be interpreted within that niche. You know, Gino's reacting differently because he's not a fan of these games. If we want to look at video games as cultural artifacts, as something sort of worthy of scrutiny, which I think we're all sort of, you know, we're here, we've been doing That's it. That's what we're here now. for. Right? So if we're going to make that claim, games are worth examining, they are cultural artifacts, we then have to ask ourselves, okay, what sort of ideology are they trying to advance? And this is the question here, because all cultural artifacts advance some sort of ideology, right? There's some sort of idea that they're putting forth. So then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what are the rhetorical moves that the game's making to advance that ideology? What is it saying in order to perpetuate myths, ideas, 
theories, whatever it might be. So I think in this case, you have to take that ideology seriously. And I think the best distillation of that ideology isn't these sort of difficulty curves we've been talking about. I think those are sort of secondary. They're not really that important. I think the most, because there's not a lot of rhetoric in this game, I think the most important rhetorical moment is the introduction (laughs) is in the introduction of a difficulty setting called promenade mode, which is itself a joke. I don't know if you guys played it, but it's an absolute joke. And not only that, is it uh, what's the word I want? It bars you from participating in the vast majority of the game because you've chosen a secondary difficulty setting. It's not just that it's easy to the point of basically mocking you. It's separating you from large aspects of the gameplay. And I think that's the moment that's advancing the sort of ideology that Gino's pointing to. What is promenade mode? I did not see this. It's the easy mode. What does but it they do? They call it promenade because you're just sort of strolling through the game. You basically it basically turns every boss fight into a stand there, and you just sort of hack like the three hits, health bars down, and it skips a whole bunch of intermediate phases. Basically, chops the game in half. Um, I can read it. It says um, promenade is one of the two options available. It says promenade. Anyone will be able to enjoy the universe and the story, but the game will be much shorter and very easy. Does not unlock trophies, the furier difficulty, and the speed run mode. So it, it after beating Promenade mode, you don't get the unlockables after beating it um, you see the original the way. Yes, and then the, the other mode that's available from the start of the game is called Fury. In parentheses, recommended. The game is balanced to be challenging and demanding. It's going to be tough, but you will enjoy the adrenaline of combat. Difficulty mm, can be changed to combat. promenade after a game over. So, like, those are the two options you get, and I read them verbatim from the game itself. Yeah, that's advancing an ideology independent of any sort of consideration of whether or not you're a fan of the game. And I, for me, so going into the story a little bit, we've kind of been beating around it because we've mentioned different bosses and kind of their aesthetics. That's almost all the story, but... The eighth boss, the Edge, his whole thing is he is a practice samurai. And he is just you, basically. He's like the mirror of your character, almost. And his whole thing is you are what you repeatedly do. Excellence practice is a habit. Perfect. You are yes. what we repeatedly do. Yeah, that's his quote. I love it. I love ethics. that quote. And that is the that, for me, was the thesis of the game. Do this thing over and over and over again. And you'll get better at it. And my the question I always was asking myself is, what am I getting out of getting better at this? And I've, you know, I've gone through repetitive things before. I've practiced things before in my life. You know, I, I believe that there's a virtue in things like, you know, choreographed dance or like a specific, like I spent all my weekend making tomatoes for tomato sauce so that I would have tomatoes through the winter. That took a lot of hours and a lot of time, and all, all of it was repetitive, and I got slowly better at doing it. But at the end of the day, I had something to eat, or I had a nice I dance that I could this. perform that people would enjoy. Um, with this game, I don't... Like, at the end of it, there are these sections that it's... It is high-level bop it. Like, there are three moves that you need to do, and when they do the animation, you do the answer to them. Like, the edge... I don't know... It, maybe there is another answer to his moves other than parry, wait a second, parry, parry. Parry, wait, parry, parry, parry. But as far as I know, that is the only answer to his moves. Like, you just parry them, and you memorize the timing, and you memorize the animations, because all of them have feigns, and they all have specific um, timings to them. And then once you do that, it's not that hard. But until you... Put in the sweat equity of just getting killed because you didn't know what a move was. Sweat equity. The sweat with the <laughs> sweat equity. That's good. I like that. Um, and um, until you put that in, there's no there's no getting up to one of these bosses the first time and going like, oh, I just totally knew what to do because you know this game taught me. Yeah, there is. It, it, oh, you beat a boss on it on your first try. Yeah. Was it any of the bosses past like three? Uh, two, four. Six and nine. Okay, nine is like not nine, nine, nine is a joke. Yeah, but nine. I beat Angel Lady first try. I didn't have to restart Angel Girl. Okay. 
You did it. Well, okay, look. Let me tell you how I beat eight. And I, so like, I think it's different, very different than what you're saying. I thought eight was, eight was the boss that I lost to the most. I died to the edge more than any other boss. And it was hard. And I suffered the same thing you suffered of saying, God, I'm just memorizing timings here. And I had, and I played the game continuously, like very, very continuously for like hours a day for a couple of days in like a very tight packet of like mass binging on this game. And you go from, uh, you go from the burst to the edge. That's a way different boss fight. And so my mind was like programmed for the burst and I was going to fail at the edge because I wasn't taking a step back, right? So I took like three days off of the game, came back, beat on my second try, and I didn't have to memorize anything. I just had a way different mindset going in and was just going to say, I'm going to be relaxed and super reactive, and it worked. And yeah, I died a couple times, but my step back made me come in and just enjoy that so much more. But saying that I didn't have to memorize anything. Yeah, I played it for several hours for three days, and then I took a break. You did the memorization by dying a bunch of times, learning the moves, no, and then your brain processed it. I didn't it get better by doing that. It. I didn't get better by by doing that. When I beat when I beat the the, the edge, it wasn't because I memorized his patterns. Because I got to the last phase for the first time, and I and I I only had to try it once to get to his last phase. Like there his was last part... phase is very similar to his second phase. He's one of the only bosses who doesn't have like a crazy different phase. Either if way, you beat his third phase, then his fourth phase is very similar. I didn't have to memorize his entire move set. I kind of had to do that for number uh, number five. The hand gave me some trouble too. The sword and shield guy. I had to remember what some of his moves did so that I would be prepared to counterattack. And like I had to memorize some of his animations. I had to memorize what the burst did because that sniper lady was, yeah, she was she she was kind of insane. But when I fought the edge, which is the boss that I think was the hardest, memorization wasn't what won for me. It was a different state of mind. And that's fair. I just, for me, I beat the edge in like I would say like maybe seven or eight tries, just because I accepted that it was bop it, and I was like, well, I'm gonna learn. His moves, I'm going to hit the parries at the right timing, and then I'm going to kill him because that's that's what it is. I think we sort of danced around Pete's question of, like, are we going to say that this game promotes some sort of, like, cultural theme? Is that the right word you want to look no, for? No, it, it promotes an ideology right, because okay. it's a thing. We're, the question is just what ideology does it promote, and I've offered my take on it. I think... I agree with Pete's take. It is one of you play it the hard way and you just do it the way the game wants you to. And if it if you don't play it the hardest way, you're playing it wrong, according to what the game says. I, you're ignoring the story. Like it's there. I would say that's the ideology. What what part of the story? Uh, all right. Here, this is how the entire package works together to present something uh the difficulty the the varied environments uh the way the bosses talk to you uh you go through the game you go through these levels you you just like essentially rampage and murder everyone on the way you're interacting with these people they're telling you like what their story is and why they have to stop you you finally get to the end. You've experienced all these different people that all want to stop you from escaping because you're bad news. Uh, it culminates in the beat, uh, which is like a little girl who has no place to be there. I definitely noticed through playing through this game, looking at like the character's face he gets more apprehensive about what he's doing as you go. Like, the way his face looks when you're with the angel lady in the garden, you it's can tell he does sad. feel bad about going. So that all culminates in uh, him going back to the planet. You really see how bad of news he is. You're walking through the fields. Everything dies near you. You find the rabbit dude, who helped you escape 
well, the story would be that the rabbit dude was one of your jailers, but he decided what he was fighting for. It wasn't worth it if he could never go back and experience that. He goes back, sees his daughter. Through your experiences of murdering all these people, you, who, I don't know, you're a robot or a clone, I don't know, you've learned to, I don't know, value life. You go up to the, the mothership, you blow up the mothership, you save the planet. Uh, and man, if the game gave me a way to interact with the other characters other than frickin' murdering them, I would... It, it's you do a, get one. It's a guided tour I through mean... their story. Just like... Just like books, movies, plays, it's a story... Games let you interact a little bit, but it's still somebody's making it. It's their thing. What are they telling you? These aren't mutually exclusive or incompatible messages, though. You can have this sort of message at the story level, which is sort of, yeah, value life, whatever we might want to get to it, and still have a meta critique of gaming as itself in the same way that sort of literature can present a story, a tale of something, while still having a meta critique, a question of, okay, what is literature? How should a story look? These are completely pat compatible levels at which to operate. Okay, so you can look at it as it's perpetuating the get good like discussion, and that's terrible. Or you can look at it as, hey, I like challenging games. I like to be challenged. A lot of games that I've played recently, I don't know about you guys, but playing through them, I don't feel challenged. I played the new Tomb Raider. It was like, I don't know, some Indi Indiana Jones story. It didn't really pull me in because all the danger that was going on, it wasn't really dangerous. I, I appreciate that this game really pushes the difficulty because it makes beating it kind of mean something to me. And, I mean, I guess my ultimate critique of this is, like you said, the lack of a challenge kind of makes stuff feel frivolous, or it makes it feel as though there's not a reward in mastery of different kinds of games. And I think I've just come to the point where mastery of a single game in isolation does not hold a lot of allure for me that a, a lot unless of unless i can a lot of the skills that you need to beat this game are not applicable because yes they're not creative but they do come down to like reaction times and you know memorizing patterns this isn't the only game that does that though like I was no, saying before, I, it's a long legacy of games. And in that legacy of games, I think this is well made. I just don't... I think that... Like I said, my critique is not of Fury. I think Fury is a well-made game. Like, we haven't even talked about the music, and the music in this game is excellent. I think the character design is excellent. Yeah, how have I we not talked about the music? The controls for <laughs> what they are are quite Very solid. Very crisp. Like, they, are, they are tight. Um, there's only a couple of, like, buggy bits that I ran into that kind of annoyed me but on the whole this game you know if you're it's very down polished. for some high level bop it that's cool um i just when the thesis is get really good at this set of mechanics and we are not going to build some sort of communal aspect into the game so that i can share that experience with other people like i've had this conversation with you john about dark souls specifically that my critique of I don't like Dark Souls for very similar reasons. However, I do like Dark Souls for its environment, for the variety of playstyles that it affords, for the story that's going on, for some of the messaging about life and death that those games have. I like those games in spite of the core of Fury, like that element of gameplay where you're up against a boss and you're going to die a bunch of times and you're going to memorize its patterns and then you're going to advance. I like these games largely in spite of those loops. And so the allure of challenge 
Like, I, I've just personally, I just find life to be too short to memorize, like, a boss's pattern and have that be an intrinsic value to me. I just want there to be some either an applicable skill or some level of knowledge that I'm gaining that I can feel like I've walked away from a game with something <clears throat> with something learned. And I think that, you know, the music, like some of the other stuff about this game does give me that sense, but it's not playing it and it's unfortunate. What if, what if you're what you're walking away with is like the the feelings you experience while playing like the the music the environments the the difficulty they contribute to like a sense of i don't know not urgency but like a a sense while you're playing it can it not just be like a i am looking at a piece of art it made me feel things is that not valuable i think it is and i would i'm not arguing that that isn't valuable yeah. i'm saying this piece of art did not the didn't, didn't do it for you no it didn't and that, i that's fair and and like pete said like some of the very specific design decisions around this game made it specifically off-putting um I think me. that there's a part of Dark Souls that I'm re- remembering where, like, you can replay Dark Souls up to, like, New Game Plus 10 or something like that. Some some god-awful replay value of Dark Souls. And there's some, like, saying that the characters say over and over again, like, oh, don't go hollow. Don't want to see you go hollow there. And it's kind of a... It's kind of like a... Like a inside the game in and of itself, like a meme. Like, a, don't become a hollow human who is on your seventh play of Dark Souls because this game is actually just banging your head against stuff over and over again, and it gets just scaled up harder for no reason. I don't feel like there's a going hollow in Fury. I feel like that I never had to become a robot human in order to advance in this game. I think that there were very, very few times where I actually had to memorize things. But on subsequent playthroughs, like, I've played through the game, I'm on my fourth playthrough now, and my first playthrough I had to memorize some stuff because I just wasn't, I didn't understand the game enough to know what was going on, but, like, when I let it change me, I stopped having to memorize things anymore, and I just became, like, a projection of myself onto the avatar, and I was doing these things. It it, it changed me in a way, and I didn't have to play the game through memorization anymore. I I, I played the game by... The game and I were having a conversation, and we got more articulate as I got more fluent in the game. That's how I feel about it. But how do you define the difference between having gotten, having put in the physical reps to then have effectively memorized it? Between that and and gaining a fluency, because I mean, for me, like you got to put in work for stuff. Yeah, but. When I say I memorized the pattern, it's not like I just stared at a textbook and then knew the pattern. I just kept bashing my head against the boss until I saw all of his moves, and then I figured out how to counter them. And then, yeah, that boss, I was a lot more fluid because I knew everything they could do, and I knew how to do at least one answer to it. I'm gonna, and I didn't just die to that move. I'm going to draw an outside-of-the-game analogy for a second. Um, Gino, you and I both participated in martial arts when, when we were in college. I took it a lot farther and I have a black belt now, and I teach the class occasionally. This is not like a toot the horn of Billy for a second. I need to set that up because it's important um, where I ended because the journey to get there is going to be what's important. Like there were times where I was memorizing forms and memorizing how to hold my feet and my hands and stuff. And after a while, you stop memorizing. It's And then like your strength actually goes away. You don't need to be powerful anymore. You don't need to be memorizing things anymore because you just understand now. It's not memorization. Like memorization gets trumped by true understanding in almost any time you have anything academic or physical. You can be the most well-read basketball historian, but like until you have a true like physical understanding of how like – I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know shit about basketball. Name I went a basketball move. I went a direct. Name one. <laughs> yeah, you, got, you, you sort of dug yourself a hole out. I know. Okay. Good. I'm just gonna. Chaos I'm just gonna go dunk. back to martial arts where I where <laughs> I understand things. Um, take a style like Aikido, for example. 
where or tai chi even better the more force the more you try to bang your head against something like the easier it is for you to get toppled over and defeated once you let go and like understand what's going on you not only get better but you get enhanced more so I went from a stage of, hey, I don't know shit about martial arts to now I've gotten really good at memorizing stuff and I'm kind of strong, but I'm still getting my ass handed to me to, oh, now I don't have to memorize things anymore and I don't have to like plan my attacks. I just feel what's going on. I just understand what's happening around me and I get to enhance my experiences and enhance myself along the way. I feel like Fury is evoking that same determination in me. And so I don't feel like I'm just lifting weights in a gym until I get huge muscles. I feel like I'm refining myself and tempering myself until something better is at the end of this like journey. And I'm better because of it. Like I've gone through some kind of ordeal and I've come out better on the other side, but it's not just for the sake of being difficult. It's, it's for some experience along the way. And I think John's hinting at it when he says like, think about the story and the, and the aesthetics and everything that this game re- rewards you with. And how on subsequent you, you places play you get to the, enjoy that stuff more. Say you know, that again, Pete. It rewards you with it if you play it on the right difficulty. Okay, true. I so I I also kind of wish that, that this game didn't have promenade mode. I, I got to take a step back and say they just shouldn't have had it. But everything else I said I think holds a lot of water. So yeah, ah, shit. Yeah, at the end of the we're not gonna have like some agreement here because. At the end of the day, I found no. I did not find that satisfaction in, and I, I still think it's memorization. It's, it's not like this game has a curveball or something, where you have another way of interacting beyond the patterns that the bosses have, like in, in martial arts or in basketball. There's a dialogue between you and another human being who are constantly adapting your, your styles, or your. Uh, your techniques in response to one another. There is a growth, there is a dialogue and an inherent competition against another human being that this game just, at the end of the day, at a certain point, you know all the moves that the burst will ever do and you know the proper answer to them. And at that point, you're at a state of um, equilibrium where there's, you can do it faster, you can do it slightly better, but the threat of losing is gone because you know what's going to happen and that perfection of a closed system that mastery of a closed system is not something that ever interested me like even the games that i love the most like uh like final fantasy 9 the game we're going to be talking about a lot i have never ever beaten ozma who is an optional boss that is supposed to be the hardest boss in the game i have played that game for 15 years i have never beaten that boss because the time and the effort that i saw going into beating something like that was not worth my life energy to devote to doing it. I always felt. And so never ever have I felt a game like this has been worth my time to master in that way. Unfortunately. Um, Just the sheer, like, I'm going to beat the most difficult thing because it's the most difficult thing. I've never felt that about a game like this. Uh, that's not like why I play it though. I don't play it so I can say I beat it. I play it because it's a great experience. I play it because I'm changed a little bit and I like who I am on the other side. I guess this is where I jump in. I think these yeah, questions of why we play it, even the points Gino's making about memorization. Not to belittle at all the things we've been saying, but I think they're irrelevant to the points I want to make. Where, Go ahead, then. Where it's that this game's positioning... It's positioning an ideology of... I, I don't know, I'd have to think about it if I wanted to phrase in sort of a perth... Into a, excuse me, a terse, pithy statement. But it's a question of how it positions its difficulty levels relative to the experience you get out of it. So whether that ultimate experience is positive, negative, involves memorization, is irrelevant. It's the fact that that experience is relegated to a select few individuals who play it on the right difficulty. Like, you're presented with the first choice in the game, what difficulty setting? And there's a right and wrong answer. Yeah, that's If you want to have a casual experience, we're going to just give you less of the game. Yeah, the developers made a rhetorical choice, and I think that rhetorical choice, independent of whether or not we enjoy what follows, 
or get anything out of it indicates an ideology that I find reprehensible. How do you feel about Furier mode? Do you feel the same way? It's just an extension of Fury mode. There's not really anything rhetorically new about it. Like, it's supposed to be an insane hard mode, and, like, I... Like, John came over earlier tonight, and I was playing Furier mode for the first time and couldn't beat the first boss. Is there an associated description? Do you get more story if you play Uh, on... Let me look. No. You don't get any more story. Then it's Um, not really interesting. So the description is the true challenge for Masters of Combat. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really crazy about that description either, but that one doesn't bother me as much, I guess. Well, I would agree yeah. that having a furier mode that gives you nothing and takes away nothing from you is more forgivable. That's, yeah, that's yeah, fine. Like, it just says, hey, if you want to be an insane person and just like play this game as hard as it possibly can get turned up, level 11, hard difficulty, you know, that's fine if somebody wants to do that. It's never forced upon you. But yeah. in order to experience the game, fury mode is forced upon you. If you want and, to scale difficulty and you enjoy that, more power to you. Right. If you want it becomes a moral or even a storytelling prerogative that it becomes problematic. There was another experience that I had with a game called Infamous where I had just come off playing some really hard game. I forget what it was. Um, and I was like, man, I'm going to just take a break. I'm going to play a really different game now. And I picked up Infamous and I played on like easy mode. I was like, I, I just want to like have a really good enjoying story mode. And midway through the tutorial level – the game increased the difficulty for me. It said, we're moving you up to this difficulty setting based on your performance. And I thought it was funny at the time, but now I think Pete might have a similar problem with this, saying like, no, you can't you can't play on casual mode. If you're going to get this game, you better work for it. We're going to make it difficult so that, so that our gameplay matters now. And I can see a, like a really valid criticism there. I think this game would have been better off not having promenade mode because you're right. Why even play it if you're going to play it where the bosses are a joke, and it's almost kind of mocking at this point. Like, okay, you're playing on diapers mode, and, like, big boy mode is over here in Fury category, so you you are you can play on Promenade, but you're a joke if you do. I would agree that that's probably a bad I- inclusion of, of the game, and it's probably taken away from some of the experience. Yeah, and the some of the achievements are actually, like, beat the game faster than the developers did. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of like that because that's me having a direct conversation, even though it's kind of short, with one of the devs. Like, hey, let's like compare run times, bro. And I kind of I I kinda like that. Yes, it's leaderboardy, and yes, it's kind of grindy because we're probably going to have to practice to, to get good at it. But once I do, I can imagine like a virtual pat on the back by one of the people who made the game. By the way, we, we actually met those people. Actually, I did when I was in PAX this last year. I got to see this game in alpha mode and play a little bit of it, and it was cool, and I got to talk to the devs, and they were really cool. I got to ask some cool questions. They they were actually just looking for, like, a really, really fun, fast-paced action, rewarding combat, cool aesthetics. They just wanted to have all these, all these cool things. And the brief conversation that I had with them said that um, now, a- after I've seen the game and basically torn it apart, they got exactly what they wanted from their product. Well, I really hope they didn't want a slow, methodical, story, story-driven, uh, yeah. introspective narrative. <laughs> no, because let's, otherwise they really fucked up. Let's take a break for a second and talk about like some really, really cool shit. Let's talk about some sick-ass character design and some music and some aesthetics. Like we touched on it a little bit, but I want to sing some praises because this game had some really, really good shit. We've sort of been bickering. Let's just like I want to just like unwind for a little bit and talk about how great the soundtrack was. <laughs> It's good. It's a techno soundtrack. I I wasn't playing with headphones on, so some of the my speakers aren't super great. So it was a little tinny for me at first. Yeah. I listened to the soundtrack independent of playing the game uh, with headphones on, and I appreciated it a lot more. It's solid. Um, <clears throat> of games with this style of soundtrack, I think it's... It's up there. I think I, I still prefer games like Hotline Miami or um, even Shatter, which was a PlayStation Network game from the mid two thousands. Um, but it's solid. It's good. It's good techno. Sort of. I like the different themes uh, of the characters. I like how the the sound fades in and fades out depending on 
how messed up your character is. Yeah, like if you're low health, it will have sort of like a like a It'd muffled sound. Yeah, it'll like be um, sort of like a stretched out, chopped up version of the um, of the actual sound. I like that when you do have a successful parry or a, or like a charge attack, that there's like this boom, like impact, and it feels so like meaty. You know, like the sound design is so good here. I think that the parrying and the hand-to-hand combat stuff sounds great. It pairs with the music. It feels like it has like a resonance. Like I said, I think meaty. Like meaty is the right word for it. It just feels so thick and good. I just can't say enough weird sensual <laughs> things about the sound it's design. So thick and good, man. It's just like thick and meaty, man. <laughs> it's just man, this sounds turgid. <laughs> Am I right? Sounds swollen almost. <laughs> Swole. Wow. Um I think yeah, that I, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Um there were times where the screen was filling up with hot bullshit and I was thinking to myself, like, wow, somebody put a lot of thought into Every little beep and boop that's about to kill me. <laughs> Sorry, I tumescent. That was the synonym I wanted. That's another word for engorged. Tumescent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'll give an example. Um, which was this boss fight? It was. It was either four or six. I, I'm I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure it was four. It was the scale, and there was a part in the fight. Uh, not the very end, but I think towards the end, where he starts doing melee attacks at you while while there's also like rings that are sort of like expanding from certain points. Yep. Yeah, and I think that each of those wave type sound paired with the combat has made it like very different. Like there was, it actually felt chaotic in terms of the sound and the action and what was on the screen because I was also poisoned because I took a hit because I'm a noob and like my screen was all blurry and shit. So like it made me feel really cool and the, it couldn't have happened without the sound um, design playing its part. Yeah. Uh, mm. That that blurriness and the camera sometimes. I thought that was so cool. That you get like poisoned and it like makes your vision blurry, like the screen goes all wavy and stuff. Yeah, in a game where <laughs> precision and keeping things on the screen at all times is central, any time when I got hit by something off screen or because I couldn't see it, when the game is already hard enough when I can see it, was just like that was another problem I had with the burst sniper lady. There were times when her little drones would just fly off screen. Yeah. And I would just get hit from nowhere and it's like, well, Fuck me for not being, uh... That's actually the only boss with ads. Positioned. So, like... Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, like, that what that boss and, uh, was introducing. Her and I got... the Who is the strap? The, the second one? Yeah, the strap one time. I was running around that huge arena, and she was off screen for a second, and she charged up her f- face laser and frickin'... It went through all of the walls and yeah. killed me. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't see her at all. Uh, so. In that fight, if you separate yourself far enough away from her, the camera pans out so much that you can have it like clip out of the boundary and then you can't see anymore. Great. It sort of clips out of the arena. That was actually, great, too. That was a slight design flaw, but I don't think they could have foreseen somebody trying to be on the exact opposite side of the arena as the boss. Like, Reasonable that, that that might not have come up in playtesting. There's another time where it happened. It happens in the in the hand. Like there's like a there's like a tree branch that can sort of get in the way sometimes. There's a couple design flaws in the burst uh, sniper lady. It, if you remember, there's like pillars that raise up and down. You can actually get kind of caught on those and just be looped into death by accident. It doesn't happen very frequently, but it happened to me once. Um, if you get like you know those pillars. That as soon as you stand behind them, she shoots them, and then they fall yeah, down. I, I know again. exactly what you're talking about. And if you stand where they're going to spawn, you get raised up into the air, and it treats you like you fell off the stage. But you respawn Great. right there again, so you just loop Great. until you're dead. Yeah, I had a couple of times where she had her little reticle on me, and I stepped behind something and then stepped out, assuming that she had fired. And then the reticle reappeared on me, even though the shot sound happened. And so I just instantly died. Huh. Which was which was not super fun. Um, 
there's a lot of weird quirks where that that kind of stuff will happen or like the edge sometimes after he would kill me he would then proceed to do like three or four combos on my body until the game decided that oh it's time to reset you so a couple of my deaths he then proceeded to just kind of style on me for about it's 10, styled 10 on. seconds <laughs> until uh until the game decided it was time for me to respawn which eh, it happens so of these bosses who was your favorite I you can de- say definitely for me or... the song, the angel lady. I think she had one of the best music. Yeah, overall well. she was definitely the best. <clears throat> Who was Sword and Shield, dude? I forget the name. The hand. The hand. I liked the hand. Hated his kid. I would have been a lot happier if the kid wasn't involved, <laughs> but he was my favorite one. <sighs> Maybe I just really, really like tropey, like self righteous monologuing Ugh, but like, that oh, just... I'm gonna show you son this is what being a man's about like maybe, I'll teach maybe my you son just a... see yourself as a protective father figure oh man maybe I do Perhaps. see myself maybe. as a protective father figure Jesus <laughs> thanks for just throwing it right out there John right. um, but the line where it was like I'm gonna teach my son a valuable lesson that when that when good men look away evil prevails <laughs> like i was just so ready to hear that line every time i died i was like man who all right i died but good thing i'm gonna get to hear that sick delivery won't <laughs> but God, again. Evil didn't prevail <laughs> um we need to actually get to some of the um oh yeah we need to actually get to the story but we can talk about our bosses my favorite boss i think is um my favorite boss is the edge he's the one that pushed me the hardest and he's the boss that I think had one of the like I think it's I I think the edge is the fight that I liked the most but I think the aesthetic of burst was my favorite aesthetic. She had the coolest style, coolest voice acting, um a cool level design even though like it was huge and the actual fight was rough. I think her I think her level was really neat. Um yeah, the act, I'm not talking about the actual fight, but like the whole aesthetics behind her level was was really cool. The edge and the burst, I think, are my two favorites. I like the line, old dude. Yeah, I liked his his yeah. Zen garden, and I liked <laughs> that the elements of time that played and rhythm. Like that was one of the only boss fights where I felt there was a true rhythm to. Uh, I know that there were patterns going on, but. I felt a, a larger sense of beats, and maybe it was just the dude had headphones, and it's very deliberate in like time stopping and then coming back, and then I liked what they were doing with um, patterns in that particular fight, and I think the edge was probably one of my favorites just because I felt it was the most honest fight. Like I'm here because I practice this shit a whole lot. I'm just like you. We do the same sort of shit. We have, like, the same outfits. We're just going to do this. It No fucking guns. No running around with this stupid bullet hell stuff. We're just going to fight. You're going to hit the parry button four times because I'm going to do this move. And then you're going to hit me once because I dodge every time after you hit me one time. <clears throat> and I can deal with that. I can. There was an honesty to that. It's like, okay, let's do this. Let's rumble. And then you're going to have an aura. the code of the somebody. warrior. Yeah, exactly. I'm so ready. Pete, what was okay. your favorite one? I said the hand already. Oh, yeah, yeah, the hand. And then you gave that good, good speech about fathers and sons. Yeah. And that touches your heart deeply. Mm. I, I got to also bring up the beat. The more I think about it, that actually might be a close second. The It's the, like, the hockey girl right before the end of the game. That fight is so, really cool. It's like a platforming fight. So can when you're in her final life bar, does she actually hit you? No. Can she hit you? I don't think she ever that fights back. Gun. No, <clears throat> she doesn't, right? Yeah, I don't I don't think she fights back. She just complains about you killing her. I think this fight's important cuz it says like it, I think this is supposed to be a, the fight where you say Jesus, I feel bad now for like having to do That's the one, not killing a man in front of his son, not killing an old man. It's not because a woman of this offers you peace. It's the story behind it and we're going to get to that stuff in a little bit. It's the story behind it like when the rabbit guy is telling you he's the one who put you here in the first place. He's the reason why you're here. Like yeah, 
yeah, you feel you feel bad after killing the hand, and I felt bad too. But I think the time that you beat the beat, oh, that's when you when you when you defeat the beat. That's, that's the first time. Better. That's <laughs> my new uh, rhythm game. <laughs> when you defeat the beat, the beat. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, when you when you defeat the beat, she's the only one who's like, I don't want to fight anymore, but you have to kill her, and then I feel really bad about it. Every other boss will be aggressive towards you, with the exception of the line, kind of. He's the only boss that's really passive, but he's still trying to stop you, trying to get in your way. Um, the beat is running from you for almost the entire fight. Every boss will attack you first. Even... Uh, Actually, the only boss who never attacks you first is the line in fury mode. He starts off with his hyper defensive rings, and then you have to be the one to attack. Mm-hmm. But he's he's also standing as a barrier. He is a wall you have to get get through to one advance the story, but to advance any of your goals, he's like the and line he's not in the gonna. Sand. Yeah, he is the line, so he's a very all de- together. yeah he's in a very <laughs> defensive position, but. He also gets aggressive later in the fights, and, and, and he will start hitting you first. The beat never does that. And at that point, I think the character is supposed to realize, like, the player, like, oh, shit, like, we're a monster now. Like, what are we doing? So in a lot of sense, I feel like the Edge was the last actual boss of the game, even though there were, like, fights afterwards. Would you say that's the moment you went over the Edge? <laughs> yeah, sure, man. Mm. Sure. Delicious. Mm. A lot more death than I expected in this game. <laughs> I just... For me, after boss two, every boss that I fought, I was like, oh, I'm the bad guy. Of course I am. Yeah. Like, old man who eh, boss isn't four? attacking you at first. Yeah, because he's like, you made me this. And I'm like, oh, I probably actually did fuck this guy up. And I didn't get to see that part of the game. Because yeah. I'm starting in fucking jail. Uh, I'm not guy. starting... Yeah, yeah, the fish the guy. Scale. He's like, I am this way because of you. And uh, Bunny Man's like, he's going to say some crazy stuff to you, but don't listen just, to him. Just don't believe him. Like, all right, Bunny Guy. <laughs> I don't, you I say, don't Bunny think guy? anyone is going to argue that like the writing of the story was like good. But I don't know. <laughs> I liked this, this, some of his cryptic lines. Like I found them intriguing in spots, but... At no point was I like, Bunny Guy, you're convincing me of your perspective. <clears throat> he has a you're name. You're not a trickster. He is the voice and also the architect. He is, he is, the, the, voice. He is the seventh boss, and you skip that part of the fight. He says, this is my, this is my, uh, my job. This, I took care of this one. Yeah, yeah. He said, yeah, yeah, don't, don't worry about boss number seven. It's all taken care of, and it's totally him. He has an important line of dialogue, though, where he explains his motives for what's going on, and John hinted at it, but the rabbit figure, the voice, says that he transitioned from architect to father. Like, the ar- like the, like the architect... I-, I forget the actual line, but it's something like the, the, the architect stopped deciding, and the father started acting. And so, it's revealed what the motivations were for this character. He's the one who designed the whole prison and all the levels and everything... And he realized that everything he was trying to protect was his daughter that he couldn't have because, he, you know, he he might as well be dead and the world is over because he doesn't have the only thing that matters to him. So his only way of achieving that is by having you come out of prison, something happens, get through all the jailers, get through the maze of a, of a prison and get back to, to terra firma so that you can have – so that he can have his daughter again and he hopes you make the right choice. Which we should like, get into those choices now. Which is, uh, before we even say what it is, what an unnecessary twist. Like, Jetpacks in space? Like, Hacked on <laughs> bullshit they didn't need. Yeah, so once you break out of the jail after killing all of these people, some of whom are, are largely innocent, um, you break free, you go to this planet, uh, you are a calamity. That everything you – everywhere you walk dies. Every plant you touch dies. Everything you see turns to stone. And uh, <clears throat> you, the credits roll and then the credits unroll and you can go see the bunny dude and his daughter. Um, and then you get to make a choice about – you go to space and you go back to your mothership. 
because you're like a clone man and your name is the writer, I guess. Writer. And, uh, writer, whatever. Just writer. Just, pro- just and, proper noun. And Zordon talks to you <laughs> and says, welcome back. Uh, should we assimilate this planet or let it go? And then you press uh, X or like triangle to either destroy the planet or destroy your mothership. And then it becomes a bullet hell shooter again. You do get the option to destroy the planet. If you want to, you can. There's no nice. there's no time where this game gives you a choice that you actually can't make. Yeah, you can. Then it's not a choice. Eight. That's not that. That's a tautology. No, 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 no. Okay, I guess I didn't say that right. But the game doesn't pretend to give you a choice ever. You actually do have choices every time the game says you have a choice. You in fact do. So, yeah, there is maybe if you choose to assimilate the planet, maybe that's the bad ending, but it's fine. You make that choice. And Gino, I thought you would like this part of the game. Like I was anticipating like this would be somewhere that like Gino, and I could agree upon the Gino game gives you a choice and you actually do have a choice. So you have two here and one somewhere else. You have assimilate the planet or not assimilate the planet. And if you choose to not, you have to fight the, um, fight the giant robot head. And then you save the world and it's cool. I want to talk about the wrong choice. I should have assimilated the planet so that the game would be over. (laughs) So there's a third ending of the game. Yes. And it's after the, after the hand, when you talk to the, when you talk to the voice in the garden, she says, you could, you could just stay with me. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The song. When you speak to the song, the angel lady, she says, you could just stay here. We can have a peaceful for resolution and you can actually choose that. The game will end if you stay with her. I tried to do that, and I pressed X thinking that it would be the talk button, but that's how I learned what the auto-walk button was, so he just walked right the fuck out of that room. Go fuck it's... yourself, Angel Lady. I'm <laughs> killing your ass. It's not a very fleshed-out ending. It's like a it's like, it's like a 20-second scene, but essentially... I tried to walk over to her and talk to her like it was any other game, but then the button that... In would make it interact, made him walk the fuck away. I thought that the game was not going to let me stay there. The, the game knows what you really want. You think you want to stay, but the game knows better. All right. So I thought for a while I was like, oh, so this game's like, it gives you the choice, but then it walks you the fuck to the kill room anyway. So Turns out I was wrong. This is important. I want to examine this a little bit. Yes, you do get a secret ending here. You can... You can stay there, and I, I I actually don't think it's triggered by how many seconds you stand still. You have to go to a different part of the level, I think. I stayed for like a good like two, three minutes, and then I just started walking around, and eventually it triggered. I'm not sure if it was me walking to a specific part of the stage, but it looked like there was like a different path on that rock. You could go to the killer path, and you could go back the way you came, and I think there was like a third path that you could have walked down to trigger the scene. But essentially, the way it's set up is that the voice, sorry, uh, the the song and writer are going to become, I guess, like partners, life partners, lovers, something. But she says some really like commitment things, like I'll give myself to you, like I, like we will, like live happily here. Yeah, Our garden right. will it's blossom. Right. It's very like Adam and Eve kind of garden bl- shit. Yeah. Well, anyway, concubine, but sure, sure, fine, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it kind it. Kinda, it kind of ends credits roll after that i like the fact that it actually did give you a choice there is like a true pacifist route no one else has to die up until this point well it's not true pacifist. well yeah because he killed killed three people (laughs) five yeah sure whatever but it's the the guy in front of his son it's the least i killed his son too it just didn't show i don't think he did he had no reason to i think it would be out of character for writer to for writer to do that um either way potentially blew up the planet you think it'd be out of character for him to kill some Re- guy's son? Regretfully, though, like he's never got a smiling face on through any of this. He doesn't smile ever. I think he just he's a robot. He's incapable of smiling. He looks super sad all the time. He's, I, I, I think he's closer to he a clone than sad, a robot. Period. Anyway, show me a time where he is, expresses a, an emotion other than sadness. He doesn't want to be killing all these people. No, I mean like any other emotion, like anger, hunger, or like something. joy, anything. Itchiness. <laughs> Itchiness. Something. It's just like sad face and sadder face. How do I even know? So, um, way earlier in this podcast, we talked about the walking mechanics and why it was good or bad. 
and I think that there's an important piece here that I want to touch on. The game subtly told me that there was something else that I could do in this mode besides the fact that there was dialogue or not dialogue saying that I that I could stay. Every other part of the game, every other walk up had some similar char- characters. You, you could either control by yourself or you could auto walk. Okay, And if you pressed auto walk, it would just take you through the whole walk up. Everything would happen until you got to the kill part. It would take you from I just killed one boss to I'm going to kill the next boss with one push of a button. And it didn't do that here. In fact, something very different happened. If you like, let's say you kill the very first boss of the chain and you press X, it'll take you straight to um, the strap. No stopping. OK, you, you it like stops in this one. It stops for a second. It stops for a to second. To let you know you have a choice. Yes, to let you know you have a choice. That's that's cool. There's two other times where your movement matters. The very beginning of the game where you beat the chain, you can go back to your cell and get a cool little scene with the rabbit guy. There's a there's like a little bonus scene you, you, you can get. It's not very long, but you get some extra dialogue and some extra insight about you know what's going on here. Then at the very end of the game where I actually missed the option to go talk to the guy my first playthrough, I just went straight to the tower. I don't know how I missed it, but I went straight to the tower and didn't talk to the voice or his daughter or anything like that. You have, like I guess, a, like a missable thing you can do there. So it, it matters three times in the game. If they had taken away your ability to control yourself between those cutscenes, it would have been too obvious that there was something to do. And there wouldn't have been any kind of reward for finding them. It wouldn't have been very interesting. It would have said, oh shit, like I can actually control? There must be something else that I that I that I can do here. And it I think just... that they had to like they were forced into making like manual walk an option. Otherwise it would have been too obvious. He's grasping for collectibles like a drowning man reaching for a lifeboat. <laughs> yeah, basically, you know, that's like all my army boys. He can possibly come up with for a collectible. I'm basically, this had, just to be, a this had to be an intentional design decision so that I could have known that there was a collectible here. This had yeah. to be. <laughs> yeah, you know, basically, why they did it. my argument holds I mean, up. Nothing. Yeah, the the part where you control it and when it changes cameras, it's like a ridiculous control scheme that they chose. But that it had to be that way baby. to let me know <laughs> that Shit, there was a secret there. ending. Yeah. That that the game was afoot. Yeah. Yeah, man. Awesome. Good game design. No. You you have an addiction, Billy. All right. <laughs> you have an addictive personality. That's why you're not allowed to play Overwatch. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So I think we've covered pretty much everything with Fury. Thanks. Does anyone have any final thoughts on Fury? Uh, Just... I'll try to be quick with this, but... At the end of the game, when the credits roll, there's a special thanks section that I just wanted to bring up. A lot of these names, the games these people were involved in, are, like, when I look back on my, like, history of gaming and what stands out to me and what games I like to go back and play again, a lot of these games show up. So I wrote them down. Uh, First one, Shinji Mikami. Known for Resident, Resident Evil, Evil 4. Resident Evil Four, both both one and four. Uh, there's plenty of other things, but I picked out another one that I thought was great. God Hand, it's yeah. a great game. Next name, uh. Hideki Kamiya, Devil May Cry, Okami, Bayonetta. Next one, Keiji Inafune, Mega Man, yep. Dead Rising. Uh, the next name I didn't know, but when I looked it up, holy crap, this guy is crazy. Genyo Takeda. He's known for essentially just punch out, but he worked at R and D in Nintendo and he's attributed to putting the battery on the original Legend of Zelda cart. So essentially like he created save games. Uh oh. he also is attributed with putting the analog stick on the N64, which was, That's a I big think, move. I think like the first, That's a good like move. big, yeah, big example of like an analog stick on your home console. Dang. Next. And I bet he's on there for Punch Out. Yeah, That's well, the reason why he's on that yeah. special thanks list. Uh, next, Platinum Games. Uh, not repeating things I've already said, but Mad World and Vanquish to. There's a through line yeah. to these yeah. thank yous. Yep. Only two more. Grasshopper Manufacturer. 
Killer Seven and No More Heroes. Those are great games. No More Heroes. Last so one. Good. Treasure. Uh, Gunstar Heroes and Ikaruga. Who I think you got? Yeah, I think looking at these games, there's a pretty clear line of what they were inspired by. And yeah. I don't know. that It just it spoke to me as like just like a love letter to a lot of the things I really love about games. Yep. If we could just snip that tree, think of how much better gaming would be. <laughs> Gross. If we could just uproot it. <laughs> no. I'm joking. I like some of those games. Way to go, Keiji Inafune. Uh, anyone else? Last thoughts. My my final thoughts, and I probably won't have anything to say after this. I, I think that this is going to be entirely personal, but say that this this kind of game is like the extract of what I'm looking for in a game experience. Um, I this is like the like the the, the herbal like extract flavor of what I'm looking for. I want a game that's hard that I get rewarded for being good at it, and I get a good enough story, great aesthetics. So, like for me, aesthetics are everything, and story can be as good as it wants to be or as lackluster as whatever. But if I don't feel good and look good while playing this game, it's not worth playing. And this game did everything that I wanted and more, so I really could not have asked for a more rewarding game experience. This is just awesome for me. And I thought about this game a lot. I picked it. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm glad I picked it as my game, but I I, I could not pick a, a game that represents who I am as a player more. Pete? A game I wouldn't have played if Billy hadn't made me. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've already uninstalled this game. I never want to play it again. I don't, I don't want to, if I could go several years without playing another game like this game, I would do so in a heartbeat. With that being said, kudos to the art director, the musician, kudos to the, like, the combat design. Like, this is a well-made game. My critique does not... It is not an impeachment of the quality of the overall game. I don't like what you've made, but you put a lot of craft and a lot of thought and a lot of time and a lot of effort into into making it, and for that, you should be commended. I guess um, I have to say the same thing about Charles Barkley. Shut up and jam guy then now. <laughs> I gotta take back all the shit that I said about Charles Barkley because it's really down to a yeah. matter of taste. Yo, word? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, really? We, you know what? If we had, if this two-hour odyssey led to Billy realizing that sometimes coming in with the harshest, hottest takes is not. Sometimes you need to temper that with some understanding. I think we all worth it. All worth. I'm it. sorry. I just woke up. Like that. That game was so shit. Damn. No, I. I mean, the points that Gino made, we, the struggles that Gino had with this game, made me think. Oh wow. Gino's just feeling what I was feeling when I played Charles Barkley Shut Up and Jam, and now I have a mutual respect for both Gino as the game player that I was and, like, that game. Yeah, I still don't like Barkley Shut Up and Jam, but, like, it, I have to respect it in a different way that I didn't before. Gino's just feeling what I was feeling when we were playing Undertale, I guess. Yeah. I think you, you appreciated Undertale more than I appreciate uh... Fury? Fury. You might be right, but I think the anger was just as visceral. Yes, the anger was quite visceral. Um, so it is my turn to pick. Pick away. Um, I have two options. They kind of depend on what games y'all can get a hand on. Okay. Uh, I want to play either Silent Hill 2 or Silent Hill 4. Uh, let me look up consoles and stuff. That's, uh, they are PS1. available for the... The PlayStation 2 and Xbox. Original Xbox. Both are? Yes, both are available for both systems. Um, I, mean, I, I have stuff. the Xbox versions of both of those, so I you can also play them on the Xbox 360 if you have the Xbox version. Oh, yeah, we're good. I, um, I think 4 has a PC version, I'm pretty sure. Oh, does it? Yeah. If it has a PC version, that would be slightly helpful. Let me just take a look. Um, oh, oh. 
and according to Wikipedia, 2 has a Windows version as well. Huh. Well, Steam does not have Silent Hill anything except for Silent Hill Homecoming. But um, I would like to play either of those <laughs> games. A 2 is the more revered. 4 is the more art house kind of weird thing. Like, it didn't start as a Silent Hill game, and it became one when they when Konami was like, hey, we've got the Silent Hill license, and people like those games. <laughs> I feel like 2 is probably like the more I I think it's the more Silent Hilly if I am recalling correctly like people think about Silent Hill 2 as being one of the pinnacles of that series so I have a slight preference towards towards that one. Yeah, but 4 is the one that like no one plays. Yeah, 2 seems a little obvious. All right, we we can roll with 4. It's all, it's all good. I just want to see 4. I feel like it's a weird experimental game it's also cheaper to get you yeah, always circle back to two let's do four all right great so next up we will be playing silent hill Four: the room what a great movie okay. yeah, <laughs> silent hill Four: the room the movie the game thank you billy thank you gino and pete and john um thank you listeners for staying tuned and thank you the game bakers for making one of my new most favorite games this is gonna make like a top list for me for sure just for you thanks guys thank you thank you pete always a pleasure sometimes even more so when we disagree good conversations all around i'd say thank you john thanks for having me uh pick a game that has collectibles and i'll help you guys pile on billy (laughs) (laughs) oh shit someday we will call in John the Turncoat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm equal opportunity. <laughs> um, and Fury was fun in a way. In a way. In a way. Thank you, listeners. Till next time. Peace. <laughs>